back for another episode. Big, big weekend of college football. Georgia absolutely throttles Texas. Miami once again needs the help from the ACC officials. And Tennessee wins a pretty physical, hard-fought game. A lot of emotions, a lot of tensions going on. But first on, we got William here. William and I are going to be going to a game together this weekend. And it's not a Clemson game. It is not not a Clemson Clemson game. game. William's traveling up here to Ohio to go to what we were hoping would potentially be an undefeated Nebraska or one loss Nebraska team, not a Nebraska team coming off a 56 to seven loss to Indiana. Yeah. You know, and we were coming into this year, Jake, we talked about this game and we're like, man, this could be a potential undefeated matchup. And we have zero undefeated teams in this game. And yeah, like you said, at least Ohio state get, didn't get drummed in their game that they lost in the previous week, no previous two weeks since y'all just had the bye week. But my, my Lord, did Nebraska get beat like a drum? A, a game was not pretty. I had it on early. I did not have it on late <laughs> at that certain point. <laughs> it was not even worth watching. Yeah. Indiana just continued to throttle. We'll be in very interested to see Indiana this weekend. Curtis Rourke is out. He's going to be a, at least out for one week with after he had surgery on, I believe, his hand. Potentially comes back next week, but Washington comes to Bloomington. College game day is a huge game for Indiana. Kurt Signetti is going to be fired up. I don't really worry about the trap game aspect because I think Kurt Signetti knows what he's doing. He's been a coach for a long time. He understands what's on the line right here. If he was a young coach, somebody a little more inexperienced, I'd feel different. But Signetti's been head coach for you know more than a decade at this point. What do we know about Indiana's backup quarterback? I think it's Taven Jackson. Yeah, he, what I know is he is a little bit different type of quarterback than Curtis Rourke. Uh, Jackson is more of a mobile quarterback, a little bit more of a dual threat, a little bit more electric with his legs. Uh, so I think you're going to see a little bit more running out of Jackson. Uh, I know he's got a live arm, so we'll see how it works. Washington's obviously been very up and down. You know, They lose to Rutgers. They also beat Michigan. Now, beating Michigan is not that much of an accomplishment. One of my big questions for Washington is their kicking game. They had a guy who was a Lou Groza, I believe, either semifinalist or finalist, and his dude has missed like seven field goals already this year. So if they get down inside the 20-yard line, are they going to go for it? Are they going to try to you know score a touchdown, or are they going to leave it up to the questionable mark of the kicker? Yeah, and did you realize that Taven Jackson signed with Tennessee and then he transferred to Indiana? That rings a bell. I, I do believe that is correct. He's a big time four star athlete. I forgot all about Taven Jackson coming out of high school. So did uh, a lot of people. And you know what, Jake? The the reason I'm not as afraid of Curtis Rourke being out is not necessarily because Taven Jackson's uh very talented. It's because of that top ten defense that Indiana has. And I never thought those words would ever be uttered from these lips. But they are Could you ever imagine starting the show talking about Indiana football? I did not. I, well, I did not. No, I can't even sit here and lie. I can't even sit here and lie. That is that is the craziest thing on the planet, but I love it. I'm here for it. But God had to punish us just a little bit, just a little bit. We couldn't have had a perfect game. You know, we've been cast out of the Garden of Eden. Now we've been cast out of the Garden of Bloomington. We aren't able to see the perfect game of Curtis Rourke being on Indiana, but we will at least see Indiana. And I think we'll, I think we'll see him beat the Huskies. I think we'll see him beat the Huskies. But we really need to jump over and talk about the biggest game of the weekend. Georgia throttles Texas in a game that I thought Texas would win. You thought Georgia would win. I don't think either of us saw it going that direction, though. Well, yes, I got it right, but I didn't get it right because I said that Georgia would win because I didn't trust Texas's defense. And boy, was I wrong. Texas's defense is... Everything is advertised. However, that offense, I don't know if that's a Quinn Ewers issue or if that's a – or if that's a Georgia's just better than you issue, but good gracious, Jake. Like, I'm, I'm trying to pull it up now. I'm pretty sure Texas had average one yard per carry against Tech, uh, against Georgia. One yard. 1.1. 1. 1. That is one point. I'm looking at yeah, one point one. Their leading rusher rushed 15 times for 52 yards, three and a half yards per carry. I mean, good gracious. Arch had a 21 yard. 
Think about this, Jim. Arch was four carries for negative one yards with a long of 21. That's insane. That's insane. So they were just getting beat up all around. I mean, I, hats off to Georgia's defense. Uh, they, they, you know, Texas got pushed around a little bit in the trenches. And, uh, you know, it showed. It showed. But Georgia's, Georgia's offense looked awful. So I don't know if that's – I don't want to do that again. I might, I might, I might kick the hornet's nest if I say this, but I don't know if that's more of Georgia's offense is still inconsistent. Again, I'm not high on Carson Beck, and I got, I got, you know, punished for trying to be high on Carson Beck this week with saying he would go for. I had him as my underdog pick. That was dumb. I had the battle of two takes. You know, Carson Beck not being elite and Texas's defense being a fraud. Both of those things proved to be wrong. Carson Beck is still not elite. And Texas's defense is not a fraud. So both of those things happened. They they ruined my underdog pick. It was rigged from the start. I should have known that. But take if I told you that Georgia passed for 175 yards, would you think and three interceptions? Yeah. Would you think that they won by freaking 15 points? No. And the fact that they were up to a 23 to nothing lead at halftime was insane. Yeah. Now I have some questions about Steve Sarkeesian Pull, first pulling Ewers because that's been your guy. I know Arch played the last couple of games. I don't know if it's the fact that you just saw Ewers and he didn't look healthy or if you just started thinking that Arch Manning is the answer here because you didn't give Arch Manning a very long leash either. He didn't. So that's why it, it seemed like a panic move. Um, you know, I, It seemed like a panic move, and I don't know why you would do that. And, yeah, like you said, give him a short lease because it's not like Arch Manning had zero experience coming to this game, and it's not like Arch Manning hadn't started a game since coming to this game. He had some significant playing time before Quinn Ewers came in. So if Quinn Ewers wasn't quite ready, I mean, yeah, maybe give it a shot, see what he does, and then if he doesn't, let Arch Manning finish the game and say, Quinn, dog, like, you're just hurt. You're hurt. This has nothing to do with you not being the guy. Yes, it starts a narrative. But that's, that, that tells me Steve Sarkeesian listens too much of the outside noise. If you're going to worry about the narrative that's going to come in and, and the media that you create by having a quarterback controversy, you're not going to be an elite football team anyway because you're allowing the outside to influence the inside. If Archman yeah. gives you the best opportunity to win, you keep him in there. If he doesn't, it has nothing to do with what people will say or think about it. I think there's a lot of fans that look back at the Alabama National Championship game with Tua and Jalen Hurts. And Nick Saban making the change with, from Jalen Hurts to Tua. And obviously, Alabama wins that National Championship game. The chances that you get that type of success are so slim after an established starting quarterback coming out for the high prized recruit. I know that. The unknown is exciting because, you know, Arch really didn't play anybody good, if we're being honest. He didn't play any super talented teams. He played Mississippi State, which isn't very good either. But Arch Manning, I know he was number one recruit. So was Quinn Ewers. So, Jake, I will say this before, before you continue on that take. The difference in the situation is they left Tua in. It yeah. wasn't like Tua went in and then they pulled him right back out. They left Tua in, or Nick Saban left Tua in when he made that decision. And that, that's, that was my biggest issue with it. But go ahead. Sorry. And the other thing about this is now Quinn Ewers has to look over his shoulder every time he makes a mistake. For the rest of the season, every time he makes a mistake, he's got to look over his shoulder. Are they going to bring Arch in? Am I out? Is Arch in? I mean, that's a blow to your confidence. That's absolutely a blow to your confidence. If all of a sudden, every time you make a mistake, you have to worry, is Arch Manning coming in? Is your job gone? Quinn Ewers doesn't have any eligibility left. This is his final year. Well, actually, I take that back. I think he does have one more year left because he technically redshared Ohio State. He's not coming back. Like, he's not coming back. But really, this is his last year. So if you pull him, you know, he's gone next year. You know, that's fine if you're going to run with Arch. And I think the belief is that he is gone and they are going to run with Arch next year. But you you really hurt Quinn Ewers' confidence. Yeah. And maybe Quinn's got a tough skin. I'm sure he does. You know, playing at Texas, you cannot play with thin skin. You got to have some thick skin to be the quarterback at Texas. Right. But there is always going to be a portion of his mind every time something happens. You know, <laughs> they get stopped on fourth down. 
There's an interception, a bad incompletion. Am I getting pulled next drive? Am I getting pulled next drive for Arch Manning? But I, granted, Arch didn't do anything to really help himself to make that case. So maybe that helped with Arch Manning only throwing for 19 yards. Well, and Jake, I, I also think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the controversial call. And I, I will tell you personally, the, the, it should, the call should have never been made in the first place. The, the pass interference. But for people who don't know what I'm talking about, the pass interference, the defensive pass interference that was called on the field, Texas, I think, had a pick six um, or close to it. And uh, did he end up scoring on that, Jake? Do you remember? Um, I don't believe so. Yeah, the controversy overshadowed the actual play itself. So I'm, I'm drawing a blank on that. But um, the call is made on the field. So the, the, the referees drop the flag, they come together, they discuss it, they keep it. The place goes nuts. The place goes nuts. They're so mad. And now I'm having I'm having camera difficulty. This is I you know, guys, this is this is great content. Uh my phone is jacked up, so I don't have my notes today. My camera's now jacking up. So this But is, so this what is, you're saying is they make the call. They make the call, and then the fans go absolutely nuts. You know, we get the full-on Tennessee throwing the mustard on the field kind of aspect, and all of a sudden they decide that they're going to overturn the call. And when you overturn the call, You're watching this on YouTube. Skip ahead a little bit. Technical issues. I'm just going to add this part out. Yep. We're back, Jake. We're back. Okay. That was, this is a gritty podcast. You know, other podcasts wouldn't be able to do this. But what you were saying about this is, so they make the call. They make that call for the past interference. Um, they call it on the defense and the fans absolutely lose their mind, you know, absolutely lose their mind. And, you know, we get a full on Tennessee mustard incident out there, fans throwing stuff everywhere. And then the officials get together and flip the call. Yeah. That, that's, that's the crazy thing. And it's like Kirby smart actually put it perfectly. He said, you've now set a precedence where if you throw enough stuff on the field, if you scream loud enough, you can get your way. And I like, so my wife was asking me all about that. She said, why did they overturn it? It obviously wasn't a, a penalty. So like, what, what's the problem with this? And the problem is not that the penalty was wrong. The, the problem is that you made the call on the field and you did something that no one's ever done before in which you made the call on the field and then you picked it up on an unchallengeable, unoverturnable penalty. So what, what kind of precedents are we setting with that? And, and you know, I'm, I'm Obviously, the, that play did not change the outcome of the game. But referees, I feel like they've been highlighted this year as just being very bad. I mean, there's a lot of games that you could argue. I know our big thing is we don't – the game shouldn't – the game does not come down to the referee because you got to make your plays here and there. Yes, uh, a significant change can happen because of the referee, but the, you don't lose a game because of the referee. However, you talk about LSU, South Carolina. I mean – Two, two like terrible, terrible penalties that are called that are no calls. And then you come back to Georgia, Texas. If Texas comes back and wins this game, I don't think Kirby Smart ever stops talking about that. And it, it's just, it's just bad. It's just bad. It's, it's unethical. And honestly, if you're swayed by the crowd that way, like hats off to the crowd. Freaking don't, don't make the call. Don't make the call on the field. If you're that freaking different, unsure about it, why would you make the call on the field? Yeah, the precedent that has been set is pretty ugly because I can think of plenty of times when stuff has been thrown on the field in different sporting events. Talk about, you know, different sports. You got Red Sox Yankees when Alex Rodriguez slapped the ball the glove. As a Braves fan, the infield fly rule, the oh, Ole God. Miss game, 
the uh what was it a uh, Tennessee game where you know they threw stuff on the field after you know towards the end of the game there's been so many games that debris and trash and everything's been thrown on the field and officials make mistakes it's going to happen it happens every game they miss a call they make the wrong call the wrong team gets called there's somebody that gets called for a holding and it really should have been you know defensive legal fans hands to the face it happens every game yes this one was very uh, was big because texas intercepted the ball but it happens and unfortunately unless you really want to start dialing in and get computers and replaying everything these errors are going to happen or get full-time refs well yeah let's, no that's let's, let's that's quit. what we need to Let's quit playing around. Let's get full time refs, and let's not have conference specific refs because there are like refs in different conferences call the games differently. So you have an ACC team and an SEC team playing in the playoff, and they have they have a Big Ten rep. Well, that Big Ten rep has been is is taught the key on one thing, where the ACC refs like let's let's get full time refs, and yeah, maybe they maybe they call conferences that are closer to their region more, but don't don't make conference refs, and now. Conferences aren't even aren't even regional anymore, so that's a, that's a bull crap, you know, thing anyway. So let's let's get full time refs, please. I mean, we got enough freaking money in NCAA, we can afford it. I'm pretty sure. Speaking of refs, let's jump over to Miami, who once again oh, wins gosh. because of the refs. Three yeah. weeks in a row, three games in a row, Miami has had the fortunate luck of the refs. Uh, Miami and Louisville go back to back. This game was absolutely wild. I watched this game. It was chaotic. There was ridiculous plays being made on both sides of the ball by both teams. You had a fake punt by Louisville. You, you had Louisville giving their absolute best shot to Miami, just pulling plays out of nowhere. You know, Ja'Cory Brooks is having a phenomenal game. Cam Ward is going off. He's got time in the pocket. He's finding guys in the back of the end zone. Finally, it looks like Louisville gets a break. They have a chance to tie up this game. Um, and sure enough, it's a ball that appears to be a fumble, at least on the field. Cam Ward's hand was going potentially forward and is returned for a touchdown by Louisville. I think this one was probably an incomplete pass. I just think it's funny that this many weeks in a row, Miami is coming down to a review. Well, Jake, and, and again, the call on the field was a fumble. How in the world did you overturn that? I, I, that's that's all I was complaining about when I was watching because I was like, there's no way they have enough information. And I know I have a little bit of bias. Like, I'm not the biggest Miami fan. In fact, I can't stand Miami. So I, I have to remove my bias. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, well, yeah, if you look at it in the slow time, yeah, I think it wasn't a complete pass. But is there enough evidence? I don't think so. I guess there was because they overturned it again. And it's like, oh my gosh. It's like, yeah, like you said, three weeks in a row. I put out a poll or description on uh, each team uh, in the AP Top 25 poll. And I literally said for for Miami, they are uh, magicians with divine intervention because there has to be something else at play. There's no way you win three games in a row that way. No way. Yeah, if they continue to play with fire, they're eventually going to get burned. The Miami schedule. I'm not saying I don't think so. Look at their schedule. I think the next tough team they play is Syracuse. That's the next tough, uh, uh, the last tough team they have to play. Syracuse, they play. Georgia they Tech. play Duke. Duke could be Duke six and one. Duke's a bad six and one. Duke's a bad six and one. Okay, wouldn't it be hilarious if Florida State wins this weekend though? That would be. I would love that so much. I, you know, shout out Justin Kripe. I will be pulling. For Florida State so hard this week. That would be lovely. I need it to happen. I need it to happen like I need air to breathe. I mean, I didn't think that Cal and Virginia Tech would take them down to the wire. So who's to say that Duke, Georgia Tech wouldn't? I don't see Miami going 12 and 0. I think they drop a game. I'll be honest. I think they drop a game in somewhere. But also credit to Louisville. They play their tail off. Their defense just cannot tackle anybody for the no. love of God. I watched so many games recently that tackling does not exist. And I can guarantee you, I, I go on this rant all the time. I go on this rant all the time. Back in 2014, Clemson. So, again, all I know is Clemson practice. So, let me preface with that. But 
all throughout the year, we tackle at least twice a week. That never changes, no matter what time of year it is. We played Oklahoma in the Russell Athletic Bowl at, at a Camping World, at the camping uh, in, in the new stadium down in Orlando. It's now the Camping World Bowl, I think. Um, and we did a charity event with the team, and I was talking with the punter. And he said they hadn't put pads on since October at practice. And we went out there and beat them 40 to 6. And they were calling uncle in the third quarter. And you, if you're going to tackle in a game and ask your players to tackle in a game, I would, I, why would you not practice it? Oh, my, you know, my players could get hurt. Well, if you're playing that way, if you're coaching that way, you're scared and you're not going to, you're not going to last. So get that out of your mind. You play to, to win downs. the game. You play to win the game. So you've got to prepare that way. So I would I would strongly, strongly, strongly assume, again, this is an assumption. You know what they say about assumptions. You're usually right. Um, that they're not practicing tackling. They're not practicing tackling all the way. You can say, well, we thud. For those who don't know what thud is out there, that's when you literally just hit the person, you thud, and you don't take them to the ground. You literally just wrap your arms and you don't take them to the ground. What is a tackle, Jake? Well, what requires you have it for to... it to be the tackle? Be a tackle. Technically, you just have to stop momentum. That's true. Or <laughs> they have to have a body part touch the ground. A knee, an elbow. Yeah, one of your extremities, elbow, knee, back, you know, back your hand, ankle, something like that. So why don't you practice that? You would think. I do think there are times where thud tackling makes sense at certain times throughout the year for certain things. Um, like, my big thing is, the spring game is your final practice of the year. There's no reason for anybody to get hurt, especially if you've been doing tackling the whole time. Right. It You do really don't want your star wide receiver, or star running back getting hurt because the defensive back just got big eyes and lit up somebody. So <laughs> especially well, his own I, teammate. Right. Well, and I agree with that. Like, don't be stupid. And, and they would teach that to like, guys, I know you could kill them. You don't have to. That know who you're, you're you're playing right now against your teammates. You know when to cut it on, cut it off. Final game I want to talk about here last weekend, third weekend in October. Tennessee gets the win over Alabama Steve, in kind of a kind weird of game. Kind of a weird game. That that is that was like that's a tale of two halves. Who was the Tennessee in the fourth quarter? I mean, that was not the Tennessee we'd been watching the whole game. I, I'm I'm very convinced that that was not the Tennessee we'd been watching the whole game. Yeah, Tennessee last week was really confusing me. Uh, Nico goes out of the game at one point. A, he wasn't playing great anyways, but B, he goes out of the game with an injury. Uh, comes back, finishes the game with only 194 yards in the interception. I mean, Tennessee was physical in the run game. Dylan Sampson was a beast. On the ground, finished with 139 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, Dylan Sampson is probably the best running back in the SEC, if I'm being honest. The guy, I think, has 17 touchdowns already or something. Jake, yeah, he's got 17 touchdowns already this year. We went into this year, and we talked about this in our SEC preview, what we thought Alabama would be best at, and that was running the football. We said we, we they might struggle because they don't have consistent weapons. We didn't know about Ryan Williams back then, so, you know, shame on us. But we're like, hey, they'll be able to run the football. Do you know Ryan Williams is 17? I did not. Holy cow. That's, you should mess with somebody. Somebody needs to know that. Make sure you like bring need... up at Pitt in Syracuse tomorrow. I'm going to I'm gonna make sure that everybody knows that yeah. Ryan Williams is 17. It needs That story needs to be told. Um, you want to guess how many yards without looking that Alabama had as a team running the football against Tennessee? I know it was like 80 yards. 75 yards. Less, less than 100. Their leading rusher had 42 yards. Jalen Miro had 11. I know that takes sacks into account, but yeah, that was bad. That was bad. Do you think Jalen Miro might be hurt? I, I mean, maybe. Maybe he took a little bit of a beating. That offensive line did not do him justice, especially late in the game. He was getting a lot of pressure. And can we talk about the late decision by Kalen DeBoer to go for it on fourth and 17? inside his own, what was a 25-yard line, after a – or maybe I'm in fourth and 22. I think it was fourth and 22, actually. After a terrible unsportsmanlike conduct penalty by Alabama. I mean, yeah. it was justified. You can't – I think it was Claw was the wide receiver. Um, no, Kendrick Law, my bad. Kendrick Law. Oh, yeah. 
was the wide receiver. I understand that there might be something that he said that was completely out of line. But when you're right in front of the ref, you cannot push the guy in the face. You, yeah. you cannot. And you have to understand the situation that the defensive back is trying to get that out of you. Well, think about this, too. There's 106,000 people talking. You're on the field. There's 22 people talking. There's coaches yelling on the sideline. There's a, there's 200 people yelling on either sideline. The ref probably is not going to necessarily understand or is going to be able to key on what is being said. But you know what he can key on, Jake? He can key on you putting your freaking paws on somebody's face. That, mm -hmm. That's just dumb. It's just dumb. And, guys, people say – people trash talk on purpose for stuff like this to get under your skin. And even if he doesn't hit him, the fact that he reacted that way means he was already lost anyway. He was already lost mentally, and they had him right where they wanted him. So, and shout out to Tennessee's defense. Holy crap. That defense can get after it. They freaking get after it. And yeah. Nick, and, and, but like, we talked about this at, at ad hoc last week. Nico's time is coming. And I think he started to click a little bit in that fourth quarter. I don't know if he's going to take that next step, but he started to click in that fourth quarter, Jake. He started, he, he started to make some damn good throws like, like he had some swag about him in the fourth quarter i mean he that, that throw that touchdown throw to chris brazil was beautiful in the back of the end zone i think that might have been incomplete i don't know how they didn't overturn it. the ball moved a little bit at the end but i'm glad it didn't i'm glad they didn't overturn it but he made some pretty big throws on the stretch yeah uh, nico nico has the talent it's going to come sometimes it just isn't that first year We've seen guys where they make that jump from year two to year three or year three to year four that eventually it clicks for them. And Tennessee is just going to have to win games on, on the ground and with their defense. Old school style, running the ball with Dylan Sampson, who is a beast. Yeah. And that Tennessee defense, which right now can go toe to toe with basically anybody in, in the SEC. It'll be very interesting to see when they go play Georgia here in a couple weeks. Because right. Georgia obviously has a really good defense. They, you know, shut down Quinn Ewers. They shut down Texas on Saturday. Tennessee might have the best defense that Georgia will face this year. Besides Clemson. <laughs> Besides Clemson. <laughs> Tennessee yeah, right. might have the I mean, they played o Oklahoma or uh Georgia well, has not played too many. I mean, Kentucky had a really good defense. Texas. Texas, I, Texas has a very good defense. I think Tennessee might be better than both of those. Really? I think Tennessee might have a better defense than Texas uh, and Kentucky. Or Tennessee might have a better defense. And a couple more weeks. I mean, if Nico can get it going here over the next couple of games, I mean, you'd really like to see him enter a little bit on a hot stretch. Kentucky, it's a really good test for him to get it going. They should be able to beat Kentucky because Kentucky can't move the ball consistently. Mm -hmm. Mississippi State, that's a nice tune-up game where he should be able to just air it out a little bit and get himself feeling a little more comfortable. Then then they head down to Athens, play Georgia. Yeah. Now, um, I have a Tennessee fan at work. Uh, shout out to Austin. He came up to me this morning. He was sipping his coffee in his little Yeti thermos coffee cup. Takes a, takes a sip. He says, William, we're playing Kentucky. I'm going to be at that game. And I'm not worried about Kentucky. I said, should be. Austin, why would you say that? You have been a Tennessee fan for all 26 years of your life. Why would you say that out loud? He's why I'm not worried about Kentucky. What are they going to do? They suck. All right. Well, I guess you haven't learned anything on your almost three decades. On should, the be. Planet. should be. You should be. Should be worried about Kentucky. Be. What? If, you know what? Ole Miss wasn't worried about Kentucky. How'd that work out? Yeah. All right, let's jump into this weekend's game. We got a bunch of games to talk about. First, though, we got to talk about Walker and Redshirts on site. Walker and Redshirts on the road. We're heading to Syracuse versus Pitt this weekend. Well, I am. You won't be up in the northern half of the country yet. Yeah, you'll be there in spirit. Uh, Syracuse versus Pitt, Thursday night game here. Uh, should be a great game for us. First game the Walker and Redshirts are media credentialed for it. So pretty exciting here for us, though. We'll have a lot of content coming for you guys this week. So I want to talk about it here a little bit. Get, get your thoughts here. We've got Kyle McCord versus Eli Holstein here. The Bama transfer versus the Ohio State transfer. Kind of interesting there. Uh, Syracuse has one loss to, weirdly, to Stanford, who is not good this year. 
Stanford, I think, has two wins, and one of them is Syracuse. And Pitt, who's undefeated, but has kind of won a couple of games by the skin of their teeth. Yeah. I think we're going to see offense galore, Jake. Offense galore. Did you know that Kyle McCord is averaging 360 yards passing per game? No. No, I did not. 360 yards passing per game. Why is no one talking about this? 360. That is that is absurd. He is averaging a great game every single week with Syracuse pass catchers. And if you watch that that Stanford game, they left a lot on the field, in, especially in terms of the passing game. A lot of drop passes in that game. That when I saw that stat, that blew my mind. But you know what? He's had a couple ugly interceptions, though. I will say that. He has. He has. He I has six him. interceptions on the year. And against UNLV and against Stanford, he had two a couple pretty ugly interceptions where he stared down a safety and hit the safety in the chest. Well, so the reason why he's McCord and not McLexis. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I'll be interested to see because Pitt does not have the best defense in the world. No. Pitt is going to need to slow down. They're going to need to find a way to slow down this passing attack uh, because – you know, when they played Cincinnati, when they played West Virginia, when they played, you know, Cal, these games have been close. Yeah, and, and but like, there's one thing you can't account for on the stat the stat sheet, and that's Eli Holstein. That dude, I watched him play Cincinnati, and I watched him play West Virginia. I think it was West Virginia, right? Yeah, uh, West Virginia. Hit, hit Cal, be West Virginia earlier. Both of those games, and the heart that guy has is unbelievable, and it's contagious. And the entire pit team has kind of embodied his his demeanor. And man, like it, it, they're going to be tough. They're going to be tough. And I think Pitt can lay it on them. I think Pitt can lay it on them. I think they're they're tough enough. Now Syracuse is a tough team too, but the game is at Pitt. That makes a huge difference. That makes yeah, there's huge. nobody there. <laughs> but you're not in the, you're not in the loud dome. You're not the dome. The, the, you're not the in the loud dome. Whatever they call it, uh, the Thunder Dome. So you're going down to pit. It's going to be cold. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. We got the walk-on red shirts on the sideline. They're going to be cheering on Honda and McCord, which is not good news for him. Not going to be cheering on either team. I'll be honest. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 That was a <laughs> test. I put a little little bait out there. You didn't I'm like Kirk Herb Street. I can't make a call on the game except I'll make a I'll make my prediction because I'm not announcing the game. So are you also taking your private jet and bringing your dog with you? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I am bringing my dog with me. We are going to let him run around the field, and he will probably try to uh, corral all the players. He will try nice. to herd them all. Good, good, good. Uh, no, this is this is going to be a fun game, and if you like high-scoring games, I think this is the one for you. This is going to be – I think we're going to see some fireworks, Jake. The key to me in this game is can Pitt force turnovers on Syracuse? They can't right. – they're, they're going to struggle to – get Syracuse to punt. Um, Syracuse is obviously got a high powered passing offense. Uh, they've only forced four interceptions this year and they've only had three forced fumbles. So can Syracuse or can Pitt force turnovers? McCord has had a couple of really bad interceptions. Yep. If he can take care of the ball, I think they can, they'll win this game. I think it's going to be a shootout. Like you said, I think Eli Holstein versus Kyle McCord is a game that people are not talking enough about so far. But if Kyle McCord is a little too risky with the ball and throws a couple interceptions, say he throws two interceptions and badly timed interceptions, I can see Pitt jumping out to a pretty big lead here um, because I'm not super confident in Syracuse being able to slow down Pitt at the same time. Right. And, and I think one thing, so Pitt is 13th in the country in sacks. They're tied with Indiana and Nebraska. Uh, Colorado, which I never would have thought Colorado would be 13th in the country in sacks. So, so Pitt can get after the quarterback. And if, if Syracuse's offensive line struggles, yeah, you, you're going to get one of those forced turnovers. On the flip side of that is they better be able to get out the, after the quarterback because they rank 104th in pass, passing yards allowed. And we talked about it just a second ago. Kyle McCord's throwing for almost 400 yards per game. So if they don't get after the quarterback, it, it could be a bloodbath. It could be bad for the pit for for the for the Panthers. So um, I don't know. I, I want I want to see Pitt be opportunistic. I want to see Cal McCord and that Syracuse team take some shots. I think that's what they do best. Um, 
Pitt has a pretty good run defense that might force Kyle McCourt. We might see Kyle McCourt throw the ball 45 times today or tomorrow or Thursday. We might. One of those, one of those T days today, tomorrow. We might. Thursday. Desmond Reed, player to watch for Pitt. He is the leading rusher with 494 yards, averaging over six yards a carry. Also, the second leading receiver, 341 yards and four touchdowns this year. Has the most receiving touchdowns on the team and is the leading rusher on the team. Uh, Eli Holstein, though, can get after it on the run game as well. He's got 266 rushing yards this year. Wouldn't really think that he is a guy that's a dynamic runner, but he's got it in him. He's got it yeah, in him. Get, but, yeah, like you said, the, the offense does run through Desmond Reed. The offense, the, the heart of the offense is Eli Holstein. The veins of the offense is Desmond Reed. You know, we need an AI host team to bring that energy, but Desmond Reed just gets the blood flowing everywhere else. Yeah, this will be a great game to be at. Now heading over to the weekend, Notre Dame will travel to New York to play Navy. I really hate that it's at MetLife. I wish no, they'd no, play no, this no, down no, in Annapolis. New, York, New Jersey, my bad. New Jersey. New Jersey. To play this at MetLife. Really wish this was in Annapolis. Really the first chance that a lot of people are going to be watching Navy on TV this weekend because Navy's undefeated. Army and Navy are both undefeated, if you haven't heard. And this is a massive game for both programs. Yeah. Notre Dame has to win out in order to make the college football playoff because they cannot be 10-2 and two with the amount of teams that are, have potential to still be 10-2 and two and have two losses to group of five programs. That's, that's you cannot point. have a loss to Northern Illinois and Army slash Navy. Yeah. Personally, I think one of them wins at some point this year. I think either Army or Navy pulls the upset. But Notre Dame needs this game desperately. Yeah, they do. And this might be this game might have might be the record for ends in the setting. So we have Notre Dame versus Navy playing at the New York Jets and the New York Giants <laughs> football field in, in New, New Jersey. Jersey. <laughs> How confusing is that? So nobody has anything to do with anything. No, but you're, you're right. And I think the key to this game for Notre Dame is that Navy comes in with the 50th ranked rush defense. So nothing to bat an eye at. And Notre Dame has been able to run the football on just about everybody. And Riley Leonard has done enough through the air. Um, I forget who they played a couple of weeks ago, but he, he was able to get it done. And I, I'm Riley Leonard is never going to wow you as a passer. I mean, he's he's less than Tim Tebow when it comes to arm talent. But when it comes to running the football, man, he's freaking tough. And that's a tough, tough, tough team to stop. So we're going to see if the undersized uh, trenches of Navy um, can can hold up against the big hog mollies of Notre Dame. And shout out to Jay Guillermo, uh, my former teammate at Clemson and the offensive line coach at Navy. He's on the Joe Moore Award, um, and so is the uh, watch list along with that Navy offensive line. So I'm going to be pulling hard for the, for the midshipmen this weekend. And I really, I mean, not only for the upset against Notre Dame, it's nice to watch Notre Dame get upset, but I'd love to see him uh, get that accomplishment too. Yeah. The big thing for me is Navy likes to control the clock. All these service academies love to control the clock because they don't have many chunk plays. You know, Navy and army have high powered offenses. Army wins their games by an average of 28 points. Navy wins by an average of 25 points, but they're going to try to control the, the clock here. Just, just this, is, reminder, but this is not the 1950s. They're going to try to control the clock, limit the possessions. And can Notre Dame take advantage of the limited possessions they have? You know, this will be a little bit more similar to the Georgia tech game last week where Georgia tech runs the ball pretty heavy. So the style of, uh, the speed of the game is going to be similar, in my opinion. I think Notre Dame is going to be ready. I think Notre Dame hears all of this, but I think Navy, I really think Navy comes out firing on all cylinders. Army and Navy have figured out ways to throw the ball a little bit. Um, th this isn't, you know, 10 years ago where you would be lucky to see them throw more than two or three times a game. Uh, Blake Horvath has thrown for 888 yards this year, which is actually a lot, and has thrown for 10 touchdowns, which is more than Michigan has thrown for. That's <laughs> that's insane. That, that's a fun stat. You know what another fun stat is, Jake? Four out of the last five weeks, I've picked Notre Dame's opponent to cover over them. And have a they... couple of them I've picked them to outright win. 
in all four of those games where I've picked Notre Dame's opponent to cover, the opponent has been has not covered. So we've got I picked Purdue to cover. They lost, I think they, it was a nine point spread, nine and a half point spread. They lost 66 to seven. Played Miami of Ohio. I didn't pick them to cover. They I picked Louisville to cover against Notre Dame, and I think that was a four and a half point spread. They lost by seven. I picked Stanford to cover, and I picked Stanford to outright win. I think that game was a, a 10 point spread because the quarterback for Stanford was out. Stanford lost for 49 to seven. I picked Georgia Tech to cover on a 10 and a half point spread, 11 and a half point spread, one of those two. And they got freaking just demolished 31 to 13. So sorry, Jake Guillermo again. Another shout out. I love Navy in this game, but that should be music to Notre Dame's ears. I think one of the other keys for this game is Blake Horvath has only been sacked three times this year because Navy doesn't lose go backwards too often. Yeah. Can Navy continue to move forward and keep put themselves in second and short, third and short situations where you know they can you know run the triple option. Blake Horvath can get the first down. Uh, I'll, I'll be interested to see if they can keep that going. If if Notre Dame loses to Navy, does that say more about Navy or more about Notre Dame? Both. Both. I think Navy that automatically get jumped into the top fifteen. I think they're right around fifteen at that point. And we have serious discussions. Is Navy a college football playoff contender this year? Is it Navy or Boise State? And I also think that there are a lot of discussions at that point about Marcus Freeman's longevity at Notre Dame. Yeah, I think if he loses there, I think he might be out. Even I mean, he might go he might go ten and two with wins fired. over USC and Texas A and M, but a loss to Northern Illinois and Navy. When's the last coach to get fired after winning ten? In games and it not be for something bad that happened off the field. The only person I think was it Dan Mullen. Did he win ten games or nine games and get fired? No, he got. It was the year after that that he had like five wins or something like that. It was something oh, pretty yeah, low. Right. Next game, LSU and Texas A and M. A game where confuses me. I thought LSU <laughs> would get challenged by Arkansas, and they clearly were not. Texas A&M, we all thought was left for dead after they lost to Notre Dame. And now all of a sudden, they're a dark horse college football playoff contender. I mean, we've this game has been weird in the past. This is the game that had 144 total points in it a handful of years ago. Seven overtimes? Six overtimes. Yeah, seven overtimes. I doubt we get seven overtimes this weekend. I would love to watch that. Can Connor Wegman win this? and? Put Texas A&M on the verge of the college football playoffs. I mean, he he can certainly win it. It's at Kyle Field. He can certainly win it. It all comes down to what can Texas A&M do defensively. So Garrett Nussmeyer has played lights out essentially all year. I mean, he struggled. We say struggled. He struggled a little bit in the USC game where he made a couple bad throws, but he's been pretty good. Even though Brian Kelly tried to throw him under the bus. But can Texas A&M's defense be show up against this high-powered LSU offense? And I think they can. Um, you know, we, we talked about it at the beginning of the year. I keep saying we can talk about it at the beginning of the year. That might be the phrase of this show. But uh, we talked about it at the beginning of the year. Texas A&M is very, very talented on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, they've been able to retain a lot of those guys. They didn't lose a lot of them when Mike Elko came in. And Mike Elko, believe it or not, is a hell of a freaking football coach especially from the defensive side. So I think this is a great strength-on-strength strength matchup. I would say LSU's defense is middle of the road. Texas A&M's offense is pretty middle of the road. But Texas A&M's defense is, is pretty good, and LSU's offense is pretty darn good. So I think we're gonna, this is going to be a fun one of those fun games where you see strength versus strength. Yeah, I am excited to see this Texas A&M defense go against LSU. Um, Texas A&M, like we said, has quietly worked them their way back into it. Um, they've just kind of been taking care of business on a weekly basis. You know, they beat up on Missouri, who we all didn't think was very good. Uh, struggled a little bit with Mississippi State. Struggled with Texas or with Arkansas. If they win this game, they have the potential to cruise to ten and one and yeah. play Texas at the end of the year because the remaining games would be at South Carolina which could be tricky. 
New Mexico State, which they should win, at Auburn, who is not very good, and then Texas. And we could be looking at two 10 and one Texas and Texas AM play for not only a chance to make the college football playoff, but a potential chance at making the SEC championship game. Yeah. And what's, what's even crazier, and, and I think you might have said it, but I was, I was pulling up a stat. This, the winner of this game is going to be first in the SEC. Both of these teams are undefeated in the SEC. Think about that. Did, would you have ever imagined in week nine of the college football season that Texas A&M and LSU would be battling for number one in the, in the SEC? I did not have that on my bingo card. Did not have that on my bingo card either, and I, I'm very excited to watch this game on Saturday. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. A game that I'm not as excited for but is happening is Missouri against Alabama. <laughs> I don't know what to think about this game because Missouri is a fraud. Missouri is 100% yeah. a fraud. And yeah. somehow they have continued to slide by. They got whooped up by Texas A&M. They have not played well. They should have lost to Vanderbilt. They Boston College gave them a run for their money. Auburn should have beat them. Auburn just could not put the game away. Auburn now they'll play well, Alabama yeah. on the road in Tuscaloosa. I think Missouri gets absolutely waxed this week. I think Missouri loses by 28 points on Saturday. Yeah, uh, well, I think if Caitlin DeBoer has any, has any you know, gumption about him, yeah, they're going to. I think he's going to get that team right. They need to be they need to be amped up because, believe it or not, they still have a really good chance to make the college football playoffs at 10-2 and two because they're Alabama. So they also have a good chance to play in the SEC championship game. I mean, th- there's, a, there's a lot – Crazier things that have happened. two losses in the SEC. I I don't think that that's quite going to happen. Jake, after this after this week, there will every team will at least have one, with then, the exception of well, every team but one. But yeah, the winner the winner of Texas A and M and LSU will be the only undefeated SEC team in terms of conference play. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibilities for you right for a, a ten and two team to get in there, especially if your two losses have only been against SEC schools. Um, so I, it is still unlikely though, because I don't see, I don't know if I see Georgia losing again for the rest of the year. It would be mm-hmm. to Tennessee. And the other thing is Tennessee would have to lose. Even if Tennessee beats Georgia, then Tennessee has to lose the second game. I think we're going to start getting into a point where it's going to be too difficult. That means Texas would probably have to lose the second game, which maybe is the Texas A&M. The other funny Everybody thing is Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt has Vanderbilt. to lose the second game because Vanderbilt only has one loss in conference. <laughs> Hilarious that Vanderbilt is five and two and two and one in conference, and their Most one of their losses is to Georgia Southern or Georgia State. We were watching the game uh, on Saturday, and the uh, the the ticker for the Vanderbilt game came across, and I said that is the most Vanderbilt thing ever. It was going into the fourth quarter, and I think they were only up seven against Ball State, and I was like, that is Vanderbilt to beat Alabama and then to turn around and and struggle and just get in a knife fight with Ball State. That is. That is what it's like to be a Commodore fan. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't look great last weekend. I personally, though, believe that Alabama absolutely throttles Missouri. Missouri has not looked good. I mean, shout out Brady Cook, though, going to the hospital and then coming back and saying that I'm playing in this game. Gets an MRI and says, put me back in, coach. Yeah, that's that's absolutely awesome move by him. Probably pretty stupid, but awesome move. He might not play. He might not play this weekend. And if he doesn't play, then I think it's going to be just – it's going to be violent. They might they might take it off the air. I am not confident. I think Alabama is more talented. I think Alabama is more complete. Missouri has played so many, so many close games. And even when Brady Cook plays, like, he just does not strike me as the same quarterback that he was last year. Right. You know, last year he was – phenomenal he has all those weapons all those weapons are back with the exception of cody schrader last week i know he got hurt he was only 11 of 22 for 194 yards even against umass 14 of 19 219 against texas a&m 13 of 31 vanderbilt 23 of 37 i mean he's not throwing interceptions but he's also not making great plays either exactly. he's not making great throws yeah, he, he's been, and you have no reason to be average with that wide receiver core. So that's shame on him. Um, and Alabama has boosted up their pass defense a little bit. They've, they've moved up to 56 in the country. Um, 
I don't know. I I think Alabama's got a lot of pride, and I think they're they're literally fighting like a like a corner rat, uh, trying to claw their way back into the into the playoff. And I wish, I only wish so badly that Florida State um, was undefeated right now and still got jumped by Alabama to get into the playoff. A two loss Alabama team. Um, oh, sorry, is that too soon? Should I say that? Final game I want to talk about here then. Illinois versus Oregon. What percent chance do you give Illinois to upset Oregon? I give it a 30% chance. And, and the only reason why is is Illinois can it has done a really good job this year of controlling the trenches and controlling the play clock. If they can go on long drives and keep the ball out of Dylan Gabriel's hands, I think Illinois can – this is not going to be a rollover game. Um, now – I think there's two things that could happen. I think Oregon's either going to blow them out of the water and it's not even going to be close. Like they, like Illinois can't get anything going. Uh, but the more likely thing is I think it comes down to a, a 10 point game um, where Oregon maybe pulls away late, but Illinois has a chance to beat them. And, and this game is in Champaign, correct? No, it's in Eugene. Ah, so that, that, that plays a huge, huge role. Um, I just don't, I don't know if, if Luke Altmaier and the boy in the fighting Illini, have the dogs to keep up with with Oregon. Um, I, I still give it a thirty percent chance though, because they get that running game established, they have a shot. Oregon runs their offense through Jordan James. Dylan Gabriel has been good this year, but Jordan James is a phenomenal running back. Has over seven hundred rushing yards this year. Was a key point in the game against Ohio State, rushing for one hundred fifteen yards. Uh, he was really the drive starter for a lot of that. Dylan Gabriel pushed the ball downfield. Illinois has a really good defense. Illinois held Penn State to only 17 points in whiteout energy. But I believe that Oregon has an even better offense than Penn State. Oregon is going to put their playmakers in space. Guys like Tez Johnson, uh, Treshawn Holden, you know, Jordan James. Those guys know what to do with the ball when in space, and they're going to make guys make miss tackles. Dylan Gabriel is elusive as a runner. I think that Illinois can keep this game close for about a half. Problem is, I don't think Luke Maltmeyer can make enough plays in the pocket to keep this game close for too long. Right. I, I'm just not confident in the Illinois skill players to go shot for shot. They have to force turnovers. The only possible way that they can get in this is basically the Michigan State way of how they kept it close was Oregon turned the ball over inside the five-yard line multiple times. Really, you'd like to see that a little bit more down, like somewhere closer to like the 20 or 30, so you're not starting at your own one-yard line every time. But right. if they can force some turnovers, I think they might have a chance, but I put this about 10 to 15% chance. Yeah, that, that might be more right. And I'm looking at it, and Illinois has the 81st ranked rush offense. I thought it was much better than that. Oregon ranks 46 in rush defense, so – I don't know. I, yeah, I don't. I don't think Illinois, Illinois has a puncher's chance. How big is that punch? I don't know. All right, let's jump into underdog because are you ready to take your college ball fandom to the absolute next level? Then you need to check out underdog. It's the easiest way to draft your perfect team. Make pick em entries for all the biggest games. We've used underdog all season, having a great time with it. Make sure to sign up today using promo code WALKON to claim your first pick and get a first-time deposit offer up to $1,000 in bonus cash. Make sure to visit underdogfantasy.com or find them in the App Store. You must be 18 or older to play in terms may apply. Uh, you went 0 for 2 last week. I went 1 for 2. Yeah, but it was rigged. We know this. Yeah, it was rigged. It was rigged. Uh, I had Nico finishing with less than 199 passing yards. Uh, Nico finished with 194. and um, Brown, Jace Brown from Kansas State only had about 30 yards that he aimed to have or uh, higher than 55, or I believe it was. You had uh, Lane from Virginia Tech to go higher than something in the 30s, I thought it was. Either way, he only had 22 yards. And Carson Beck laid a massive egg for you when you needed him to go higher than 280 passing and rushing yards and only finished with 183. Yeah, he didn't get close. Would you like to start this week? I believe if you start first, then, then you have more luck. Yeah, uh, I'll go first. So, um, Jake, you mentioned it earlier. You're going to be calling uh, – you're going to be a, a media member. 
during the Syracuse Pitt Thursday game. And at first, I wanted to pick two Ohio State players so I could really have something to pull for. Obviously, I'm not a big Ohio State fan, but I'm going to be in their house. I want to be a good guest. So if I had two guys that I had money on, I was going to cheer hard for them. For some reason, underdog will only let you bet on Nebraska players right now and not Ohio State players. So I'm a little salty about that. So I'm going to do the next best thing. I'm going to root for all the yards and all the points in Syracuse versus Pitt. I've got Eli Holstein passing for higher than 293 and a half yards. And the reason I think that could actually happen is Syracuse has the 89th ranked pass defense, allowing 229 yards per game. Obviously, 293 is a lot more than 229. And Holstein's averaging 282.8 passing yards per game. I think if it gets into a shootout and, and you know, they ask Eli Holstein to do a lot more with his arm, we could get there. And let's go to Kyle McCord. So, like we mentioned earlier, Kyle McCord is averaging um, almost a mile uh, a game in passing. And he uh, I've got him going for higher than 327 and a half. Well, he's averaging 40 yards higher than that with 360 yards passing per game. And Pitt has the 104th ranked pass defense, uh, pass yards defense in the NCAA, averaging 244.7 yards allowed per game. So I'm feeling really good about this. Eli Holstein, I'm a little iffy on, but I think I'm going to give him some juju. I think he's got enough juju to take this one over. I love it. Love it. I'm going to take uh, Justice Ellison from Indiana, higher than 58 and a half rushing yards with Curtis Rourke being out. I think they're going to rely heavily on the run game. He's rushed for at least 58 yards in five of seven games, 58 being exactly one of them. So he has actually only gone over four of seven games, but I think he's the focal point of the offense this weekend going against Washington. Big game that they need to win. I think they rely on the run game. Other one I got here is Tyree Walker from Wisconsin uh, going higher than half a touchdown. He's actually held scoreless last week, but the previous three games he had scored a total of eight touchdowns. Three touchdowns, three touchdowns, two touchdowns. This is a huge game for Wisconsin playing against Penn State. They're going to need their big-time playmakers to show up. I think Walker scores. We need him to score one touchdown. I think they get down there into the red zone. I think they rely on Walker to punch it in. Four guaranteed hits this week. Might as well put all four of them together. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good, you know what? Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that, Jake. All right. Let's go on to our walk on weekly 10. Last week, I only went three and 10. Last week, and you only went four and 10. We had a rough week all around. Yeah, we did. It's okay. We're going to bounce back this week. We're going to bounce back this week for sure. All right, starting off Thursday night, Syracuse versus Pitt. Pitt is a five and a half point favorite. My head tells me that Syracuse is going to win. My head tells me that Syracuse is going to win this football game. What's your gumption say? But my body, my body is telling me Pitt. I want Pitt to win for a multitude of reasons. I have to go with Pitt with this one, Jake. I'm not chasing the minus signs. I'm not chasing the the rank because honestly, I think Syracuse wins this football game. But I gotta have Pitt do it. I gotta have Pitt do it, Jake. I gotta have Pitt do it. I'm gonna take uh, Pitt as well. I'm gonna take Pitt as well. Pitt's the home team. Eli Holstein's been on fire. I think a couple of costly turnovers from Kyle McCord give Pitt the game five and a half points. I think Pitt win by a touchdown. I love it. Friday night, we got Boise State as a three and a half point favorite over UNLV. Who you like? UNLV has been frisky. They've been in the headlines. They're twentieth in the nation in rush defense, so this might one of be the better rush defenses that uh, Ashton Gt faces all year. But the key word is Ashton Gt faces, and you don't want to face Ashton Gt no matter what your rush defense is. I think Boise State handles this. I think, excuse me, I think Ashton GT handles this. And uh I'm going with my I'm going with my boys with State Broncos. I'm not batting against Ashton GT until I see them lose a game of a similar caliber team. I mean, he had them, you know, toe to toe with Oregon, arguably the best team in the country. So who am I to think that he can't go toe to toe with UNLV on a Friday night? The game we will be at this weekend, Nebraska is a 25 and a half point underdog to Ohio State this weekend. I'm going to be sick. You know, you're going to be at the game Thursday. I want all the points, all the yards. We're going to be at the game Saturday. I want all the points, all the yards. 
I'm going to Ohio State. Cover 25 and a half. That's a lot of points, Jake, but I'm taking them. If Nebraska hadn't gotten curb stomped by Indiana last week, I probably would have taken Nebraska. Problem is, Nebraska got curb stomped by Indiana and lost by 49 <laughs> points. Ohio State has a more explosive offense. Give me Ohio State. Give me Ohio State. SMU is an 11 and a half point favorite against Duke this weekend. Man, I love what they, I love what uh, Rhett Lashley has going on over there at SMU. Um, I'm not sold on Duke. Obviously, I think Duke is six and one. Or are they five and one? They're six and one. I think it's a fraud six and one. They struggled with Florida State. Um, they've struggled in a couple other games this year. I think SMU covers this one pretty well, pretty easily. I'm going to take Duke to cover this game. I think SMU, they, they've looked good overall, but SMU has struggled at times. I know they struggled earlier, but ever since Jennings became quarterback, I know they've been a little bit better. But I think this Duke defense is going to be up for the challenge. This game is in Durham. So I think that's a little bit of a lean towards Duke. I think SMU wins this game, but I think it comes down to a late touchdown or something of a similar nature. So give me the Duke Blue Devils. Next one we got here, the game we previously talked about, number 20, Illinois, is traveling to number one, Oregon, or I guess number two, number two, number one, Oregon. I forgot what they're ranked. <laughs> Oregon is a 21 and a half point favorite. That's a lot of points, Jake, but I think uh, I think the fighting line I get blasted this weekend. I know I, you know, I talked them up a little bit in our preview, but I think they get blasted. I think Oregon covers here. It's in Austin. I think that's the biggest, biggest difference is it's in Austin. So give me, I agree. Give me Oregon minus 21 and a half. I agree. I'm going to take Oregon on this one. I mean, they had a bye week, you know, so, or not the end of bye week. They played Purdue last Friday night. So we know that they didn't get held up. There was no sort of hangover for them. Why should I believe that there's going to be any more of a hangover? Illinois does not have the players to go toe to toe with Oregon. I think Oregon wins this game by about 28, 35 points. Missouri and Alabama will face off. Alabama is a 13 and a half point favorite over Missouri. I we'll have to keep riding this trend. I think Alabama gets it done. I think Missouri's defense is so so bad that it's going to offset Alabama's struggles and woes, and it's going to get. They're going to think they got right if they're going to get right. But I think they're going to feel like they got right after this week. I leaned on the. Or I, I hinted at this earlier. I think Alabama is going to blow the doors off Missouri. I think Missouri is a fraud. I think whenever they're going to play a competent opponent, they're going to get waxed. I think they get waxed this weekend in Tuscaloosa. I think Alabama is going to be looking for vengeance. They're going to be out for blood. And Missouri is going to be the victim here. Give me Alabama by a lot. Fun Penn time, State. This is the first time that Alabama has come into November with two losses since 2007. That's wild. Yeah. That's wild. That was Nick Saban's first year coaching. At Alabama. Penn State is a six and a half point favorite on the road at Wisconsin this weekend. Wisconsin's looked a lot better lately, um, but I think Penn State. I think Penn State handles them. I'm I, I'm riding these minus signs this week, Jake. This is this is not not good. I'm gonna take Wisconsin here. There we go. I think Wisconsin's playing better the last couple weeks. I think Wisconsin is gonna be up for this. I think this is a, a scream trap game. It's the week before Ohio State for Penn State. Penn State's coming off a of bye week. They Penn State has started slow in the last few games. I think Wisconsin is going to be able to jump out there. I think this could be a similar style game to what USC was, where Penn State might have to claw back in it a little bit. Right. Madison's going to be jumping. Jump around on Saturday night is going to be wild. If they stay in this, it's going to be loud. Come on up, come on in. Let me plug in. <laughs> Texas is a 15 and a half point favorite over Vanderbilt. Who do you like this weekend? Is it or 18 and, half, Texas, 18 and a half? Texas, 18, 18 and a half. My bad. 18 and a half point favorite over Vanderbilt. I want to pick Vanderbilt so badly, but Jake, I just don't. It's going to be in, it's going to be in Nashville, which doesn't say much. 18 and a half points. I think Texas gets right. I'm going Texas. 
Vandy has confused me, and I'm going to take Vandy to cover this game because they're home. And I think Vandy good. covers this, but just barely. I think that there's a little bit of controversy with Texas. I think there's a little bit of, you know, a slow start coming off of a pretty, you know, de- defeating loss. And I think Vandy can score points. I don't know if they're going to be able to score enough to win this game, though. I think Texas wins, but Vandy covers. Notre Dame plays Navy in MetLife in New Jersey. 12 and a half points. Who, do you like uh, Notre Dame by two scores or Navy just cover? Navy, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry, Navy, but I'm picking you. I'm picking you. This does not bode well for you, but I am picking you. Damn it, I will die on this midshipman. Well, good news for you. I'm going to take Navy this week as well. So maybe that's okay. good news for the midshipmen. That yeah. because I took I went against Notre Dame last week, going with Navy this week. I think that Navy finds a way to. Uh, I think they find a way to slow down this Notre Dame team. I think they find a way to force Riley Leonard to make some mistakes and do just enough to cover this and possibly win. Maybe. Maybe. You're saying there's a chance. Saying there's a chance. Finally, LSU plays Texas A&M on Saturday. LSU is a two and a half point dog to A&M. Shout out to the three tech pod. I'm going Texas A&M. I like defense. I like a defense over over LSU's offense. I'm not feeling. I'm very going. Confident, but yeah, go ahead. I'm going to take AM here as well. LSU has concerned me. They've been kind of up and down throughout the year. I know they played pretty well the last couple of weeks, but I think AM is the better team. I think they've got a better defense, and I think defense wins championships, and that'll do enough. We did have one question this week. <laughs> if you would really like to jump into it from always talking ball okay uh the guys at always talking ball of course i didn't have this ready uh here he goes always talking ball clemson indiana neutral field why is indiana winning and why are they winning by three touchdowns (laughs) because their jvs are playing and it's not the actual teams um i think it would be a good matchup i really do but um I think I think Clemson would handle business in that one. I don't I don't know if Indiana has enough dogs on the offensive side of the ball um, to really challenge a team uh, with the depth that Clemson has. <clears throat> now this is one of the less deep Clemson defenses they've had in a while, but I am going to entertain this. Um, and I and you're trying to pit me against my two favorite teams. You're trying to pit me against my Hoosiers, and that's not okay. But I'm going to answer this because I love Clemson. I really, really, really like Indiana, and I'd like to ask them out to the prom, but I love Clemson, and I want to marry them one day. So uh, you got to understand. You don't have to understand. It's going to be a neutral – it would be a neutral site field. Clemson travels. Ain't nobody from Bloomington traveling for this. They ain't out traveling Clemson. Little old Clemson. Everybody's going to hop on the Roy bus, the rest of y'all bus, and go to wherever the game is. They're going to show out. It's going to be a Clemson home game. It's going to be loud. And Clabe, Cade Klubnick's going to dice up that little, that little teensy weensy who's your defense like it's nothing. Yes, I'm talking about how great they are, the seventh total defense in the country, blah, 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 blah. I will have to throw a little bit of dirt on Indiana right here. I got to do it. I got to do it. For the love of my life, I got to do it. Indiana has not played a legitimate opponent this year yet. Nebraska was the best one, and they, they handle business. They beat the dog crap out of them. I just, I'm not sold that Indiana can do this week in and week out, and I'm not sold that they can do this in a postseason environment. But God, I mean, like three touchdowns is a lot of points too. So I'm not, you know, don't make me pick who's going to win the game. But three touchdowns is a lot of points. Don't lash out on me just because your your tide lost Lance Freeze. That's all I have to say. I'll, I'll end on that. Well, that will do it for us this week. Uh, Make sure to come back next week. Join us for more college football content. Uh, Make sure to check out all of our stuff for this week. I know we're going to have a bunch of stuff coming out this week because of covering the game, heading to the Ohio State game. 
Um, make sure to go and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, anywhere that you get your college football podcast, anywhere you get your college football content, we are probably there. Walk on red shirts, every sort of social media you can find us at. Uh, you can follow William at Walk on Moose on Twitter. Great follow. If you're not doing so already, make sure you follow him. He's got over a thousand followers. Yeah, 1100 now. I just got 1100. 11, See, he's popular. He's popular. Make sure you're following him. Uh, make sure to go and subscribe to the podcast. Give us a rate if you think we're five stars. We'd love to hear that. Uh, helps us out just by rating us and make sure to go and check out underdog use promo code walk one to get your special pick and up to a thousand dollars in bonus cash i uh, really appreciate everybody doing that and with that we'll see you guys again next week yep well actually jake youtube youtube channel you might get some cool content on friday if you subscribe to the youtube channel if you subscribe to the youtube channel you might get some really good content this week yeah i'm talking really good how good are we talking jake <laughs> Five-star content. Five-star content. We'll see everybody again next week.